Okay, so we're going to begin. Our guest speaker is um, Alessandro De Giorgi. He's an associate professor and graduate coordinator in the Department of Justice Studies at San Jose State University. He studied law at the University of uh, Bologna, Italy, and received a PhD in criminology. Have to tell us what that was about. At Keele <laughs> University in the United Kingdom. And uh, in Italy, Alessandro was a participant in the student participant in the student movements of the late 1990s, and in the anti-globalization movements of the early 2000s. Before joining the Department of Justice Studies, he was a research fellow in criminology at the University of Bologna, Italy, and a visiting scholar at the City Center for the Study of Law and Society at the University of California at Berkeley. And his interests in research um, include critical theories of punishment and social control, urban ethnography, and radical political economy. He's the author of a book, Rethinking the Political Economy of Punishment. And as well, um, he's written several articles on immigrant control mass incarceration, and the political economy of late capitalist societies. Currently, Alessandra is conducting ethnographic research, and maybe you can tell us something about that, because right. that term might not be familiar to yes. everyone, on the socioeconomic dimensions of concentrated incarceration and prisoner reentry in West Oakland, California. Um, and he lives in Oakland and commutes to San Jose State. So can you please welcome him? Uh, many thanks to Erica um, for inviting me here. Uh, we were originally scheduled to have this class on March 20th, but then we had to postpone it, but finally we made it. So I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, it's a real pleasure and uh, honor to be here with you. Um, so. I will definitely talk about my research in West Oakland, which I guess is, um, you know, uh, sp spurs some curiosity here. Um, but before I get there, though, um, I would like to, so what I would like to talk about today is mass incarceration, which I am afraid we're all familiar with. Um, and what I would like to, to give you is one possible tool to make sense of mass incarceration make sense of why it is that starting in the 1970s essentially this country has started to incarcerate people some people not everybody um, or not everybody to the to the same extent but to a disproportionate um, extent um, that was not there before the early 70s what happened suddenly that um, changed penal policy criminal justice policy prison policy policing in a way that has led this country to become the first country in the world um, for its prison population. Right? No other country in the world, not China, not Iran, not even the rough countries that we um, supposedly export democracy to, right? um, none of them has the incarceration levels of the United States. All right? So just to get us started, um, let me ask you, a kind of simple question. How many of you know someone in your family, in your neighborhood, in your uh, network uh, who is or has been in prison, jail, probation, parole? Okay, that is 100% of you. That, that, is, that is sick. That's cr crazy. It's like statistically nonsense, okay? Um, and yet, it's true, right? It, it is what, what's going on. So I'm pretty sure you um, read the uh, Black Panther Party's 10-point program, right? So point seven of that beautiful document, by the way, says, among other things, we want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails, okay? 
Now, let aside the fact that it talks about men only, while we know that today actually women are the fastest growing population in prison, right? But yet, the point is clear, right? It says, we want freedom because we see a problem there. Um, now, in 1966, when the document was written, uh, there were a total of 185,000 people in prisons and jails in, California, in the United States. 185,000. That's a small number. Yet, a number that prompted the Black Panther Party to say, hey, there is already something wrong here because we see who actually gets incarcerated, right? And we see that it's not everybody. The chances are not the same for everybody. So, 40 years later, in 2006, that number had gone to 1,600,000 people. What that means is seven times higher, right? 754% increase, to be precise. So if there was a problem in 1966, and I think we can agree that there was a problem with prisons, imagine in 2006 and today, where the numbers have not changed much. So, Yes, not much. There has been a recent decline in the last couple of years, right? Just, just out of financial concerns, because prisons cost too much. Um, but we're definitely more or less at the same level as 2006, okay? It will take maybe another 20 years to undo the mass incarceration process that has been built over the past 40 years, right? Um, you can't just let people out, right? As much as this would be desirable, um, uh, at least for some categories of, of prisoners, but you can't, right? So, scholars and activists have been trying to make sense of this. Why is it that prison policy has changed so badly? Why is it that suddenly this country has started warehousing its poor and minorities, essentially, uh, to, this, to this extent? Um, because, see, the term we usually adopt to, de to describe this is mass incarceration, right? I'm sure you've heard this many times. There's nothing wrong with the term mass incarceration except that it suggests that there is a mass, an in undifferentiated mass of people getting caught in the net of the prisons. But that's not true. It is not everybody who is being um, caught in the net of the penal system. Um, in other words, there is a huge number of people, but they happen to be always the same kinds of people, the same categories, the same classes of people that get caught in the system. The same um, as in 1966, only 10 times harsher, 10 times more, okay? Um, so we know, for example, that the chances of ever going to prison in someone's lifetime, okay, the likelihood of that happening is not equally equal for the different, you know, ethnic or racial groups in the United States, right? For, for whites, as you can see, the chances are very low, right? Prison is an exceptional thing, right? It is an exceptional thing. Uh, for a middle class white family, prison is a tragedy. Is how, how could it ever happen that my son, my daughter got caught and this happened? You know, let's get the best lawyer we can. Let's get the best rehabilitation program if there is a drug issue and let's get them out of there right as soon as possible. For Latinos, as you can see, they're in between, right? There is a, there's like, they're like three times more likely, right? Three times because it's 966 over 380, right? So three times more likely than uh, Caucasians, let's say, right? And then when you get to African Americans, you see that that proportion is, is you know, seven times higher than among Caucasians, right? Or whites, however you wanna call them. Um, and, and, and easily like two and a half times more likely than Latinos. So that, what that tells you is the chances of someone going to prison over their lifetime. Okay, so that tells you this is not, not mass incarceration. It is concentrated incarceration, okay? It's targeted incarceration. It's not like, oh, we've become tougher. We need to make people, you know, society safer, so let's get tough on every crime. No, it's being getting tough on certain crimes, certain people, 
certain areas of our cities, certain populations, okay? So, so how can we explain this? How can we explain this? Well, the obvious answer, if you go out there and ask people, if you ask your families, your friends, um, people will say, well, it's crime, right? We punish someone for committing a crime. So therefore, if we're punishing more, it must be that the crime problem has gotten worse, right? That's the common sense. If you switch your TV on the night news, which I hope you have better stuff to do, um, maybe read newspapers instead, right? Read newspapers instead of, instead of watching the TV uh, news at night, right? That's the feeling you get. That's the impression you get, you know, that, that there is a huge crime problem everywhere, right? By the way, we know that there is a crime problem. I'm not saying that there is no crime problem. We also know that it is very concentrated, once again, right? Um, there, is a, there is definitely a crime problem in West Oakland. There is definitely a crime problem in East Oakland. There is definitely a crime problem in North Philly or South Side Chicago, right? But then there is also other crime problems, such as the crimes of the powerful, right? Such as those who pollute the rivers, who poison us with, you know, sophisticating the food and, and, and doing what they do. But that never counts as a crime problem, right? What we usually talk about is mugging, killings, drug dealing, those things. And if you watch the night news, you have the feeling that this is a problem that's everywhere. But it is not. It is concentrated in the same communities that have been disproportionately targeted by incarceration. Crime has been actually going down. See, this is crime data between 1973 and 2008, 2010. You will see property crimes and violent crimes have been declining over the past 20, 25 years substantially. Okay, substantially, yet we kept incarcerating people more and more. So crime is really not the explanation for what, what happened. Um, there are other explanations, right? Laws have become tougher. In other words, you get higher sentences for the same things, um, you know, compared to 25, 30 years ago. Uh, I'm sure you know about the three strikes and your outlaw, right? This insane, insane mandatory sentencing law that sends you to you know, prison for 25 years to life for a third uh, um, uh, crime, whatever that is. Now it's been slightly changed through a proposition that has made it a little more reasonable. But still, it is still unreasonable. Um, you know, the war on drugs has made essentially a target of small-time drug dealers, right? They were not after the uh, kingpins. They were after corner uh, 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 level, you know, street level drug dealers, okay? Uh, most of the prison population is made of people who essentially committed crimes of survival. Stealing, um, you know, f little fraud, uh, hustling, generally speaking, drug dealing, those kinds of things, okay? Fortunately, we do not have a huge population of serial killers uh, or, you know, pedophiles in our prisons or sexual uh, 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 or rapists, right? Most of the people are people who committed crimes of survival, essentially, right? To deal with problems, to deal with uh, hardship. So, and yet crime has been going down. Um, public opinion has become more punitive. Essentially, people started asking for harsher punishments at some point, right? By people, I mean, uh, you know, the public opinion that politicians will listen to those who actually vote, right? And those who, who um, you know, they, they need, who, who support they need to get elected uh, as politicians, as prosecutors, as district attorneys, and so on, right? So politicians exploited people's insecurities and fears to show them, okay, this is whom you need to be fearful of. It's the drug dealer down the street. It's the mugger down the road. It's the uh, uh, you know, it's the, the thug, uh, uh, you know, of the inner city. Uh, don't be concerned about unemployment, not finding jobs, you know, not having health care. Here's, which is something that happened, actually, right, over the years. People, uh, uh, the middle classes, essentially, and not to mention the working classes, being, you know, poorer and poorer and more insecure and not being able to finding jobs and so on. 
Yet, this fear has been channeled against certain people because that is, it's easier to point at someone and say, hey, that is the kind of person who is making you insecure. That's what you need to fear, right? Forget about global warming. You don't know who to blame for that. There is too much going on and you can't, you as a citizen cannot really make sense of what is going on. But if I tell you, I being a politician, you know, or a news, uh, uh, news making outlet, if I tell you, you need to be fearful of gangs, that's something you can easily identify, right? Okay, gang bangers <laughs> are those thugs down there, they dress in a certain way, they talk in a certain way, they act in a certain way, so those are the enemies. And people feel reassured that the government is doing what they need to do to protect them against those enemies. Yet people forget that we are harmed much more by invisible crimes than we are by the very visible uh, events that happen in the inner city or in the hood, right? There is, there is a lot of pollution that we don't even know that we're absorbing. Um, we're being killed slowly, if you want, by um, you know, corporate violations of environmental rules uh, and many other things that we are not even aware of, right? So, so how can we make sense of this, though? Well, you know, another myth, one myth is that punishment is a response to crime. Yes, technically you have to have done something or at least be suspected, in many cases, of doing something um, to trigger some sort of punishment, right? But that's not really the point. Um, the other myth is that punishment is there, that the criminal justice system is there to serve the interests of all, of everybody, equally, right? The, the criminal justice system is there to protect everyone. That, I argue with others, um, is a myth. The criminal justice system has never really been in place to, um, you know, to, to serve the interests of everyone in society equally. Um, actually, you know, the prison system and the criminal justice system more generally is a system that is meant to keep society as it is. That's what it is about. It is meant to keep society as stable as possible. What that means is it is meant to make sure, for example, that the only legitimate way to um, acquire property is through work. Okay? Now, if you happen to be able not to work because you're rich enough and you can employ other people and you're rich and you keep accumulating power, that is okay for the system. The system is actually there to maintain that process. If the only way that you can earn a living is by working at KFC or McDonald's or flipping burgers anywhere, the system is there to make sure that that keeps happening. How so? Because if you ever decide, you know what? Flipping burgers for $7.15 an hour is not what I want. Here I have a few rocks and I'm going to you know, sell, sell them so that I can at least, I don't know, put together the fees that I need to go to Merit College. You get punished for that. Even though you're doing it to invest in your education. They don't care. Same if you do that to um, you know, um, provide for your kids. Sorry. That's not possible. The system, the criminal justice system is there to remind you that the only legitimate way for you to do that is through work. It doesn't matter how unpleasant, exploited, underpaid, insecure that job is. That is what you're supposed to do. And on the other, otherwise you get punished. On the other hand, it is also there to make sure that those who do not need to work can keep doing that, right? How so? By punishing those who try to steal from them, for example, right? Can you make sense of the process? So it is just there to keep society in place as it is. You know, when slavery was uh, formally in existence, right? Up to the 19th century, right? Um, there was a penal system. There was a criminal justice system in place to make sure that slaves kept being enslaved, right? 
whoever tried to escape from a plantation was supposed to be brought back to the plantation uh, by anyone who uh, you know, found them. Uh, there would be a reward for the person who brought the slave back to the plantation, back to the plantation and the slave got, would get punished, right? Definitely by the master, but also by the criminal justice system, okay? Um, you know, so in that sense, you can see how the system is there to keep, to preserve any kind of inequality, power inequality uh, that is in place, okay? So in that sense, you can argue that the penal system really serves the interests of the ruling classes, those who happen to be happy with how society works right now, okay? And want to keep it that way. It is much less um, in the interest of those who have really nothing to gain by society being the way it is, and those who would like to change society, right? So, in that sense, we can say that punishment is, and the criminal justice system, is a tool of class, racial, gender control, okay? It is in place to ensure that whatever positions we have in society, privileged or underprivileged, right, subordinated or dominant, it stays that way. Um, so, does it make sense so far? It's clear? Good. So, how can we make sense, though, of changes in punishment? So, if, yes, okay, the system is there to keep society as it is, but that was true in 1966 as it is today, right? Um, if the hypothesis is true. So why, how can we make sense of that sudden change that, you know, the graph here shows you, right? Where something happened here, right? Definitely, something must have happened here and it's not crime, as I told you, right? Crime has stayed, you know, more or less stable. What happened here that spurred this, triggered this mass incarceration um, in the early 1970s? So, what I, what I would like to suggest is that to make sense of that transformation, we need to look at the economy. In other words, we need to look at how the poor, right, the, the disadvantaged, right, not those in power, not those who, uh, you know, uh, make a living through, uh, you know, rent and profit, but those who make a living through work, right, which is the majority, actually, of the population, right, how, how they were doing, right, what their conditions, how their conditions changed in society, um, I suggest that we need to look at that to make sense of how punishment has changed and why this country has started to punish people so harshly after, um, you know, the early 1970s. So what I'm gonna t going to give you is just a little definition. I, I hate to have PowerPoints with stuff written on them. I like to show pictures because they stick in your mind much longer, uh, more effectively. But this is a very important principle that I would like you to keep in mind uh, whenever you think of the penal system. So this is the principle of, the so-called principle of less eligibility, right? It's very simple. Look, the prison is there essentially to control the poor and minorities, okay? Throughout the history of the prison, you will never find a prison ever in history where the middle classes or the rich were the majority of the population inside. Yet they commit crimes all the time, we know. Right? They do drugs, they do everything. Everybody commits crimes, right? Um, but the prison is meant to keep certain populations, okay? The poor and, and minorities. Now, in fact, the prison population today, as two centuries ago when it was invented, or three centuries rather, has always been disproportionately filled with poor, unemployed, underemployed, undereducated, you know, disadvantaged people. Now, the mission of the prison, right, historically, what the, what the prison has been there to do is, as we said, to reproduce, right, to keep, to keep society functioning exactly the way it does. So that means that the poor who, go, who get locked up have to be transformed into 
workers, essentially. Okay? You get locked up in many cases because you did something like taking a shortcut out of what you're told you're supposed to do to finally, eventually get there, whatever that means. The American dream, you know, uh, nice house, uh, you know, um, good living conditions and so on. Most people get incarcerated because they stop believing, reasonably I would say in many cases, they stop believing that if they keep flipping burgers they will eventually become rich. Right? It is laughable, indeed. And so they decide, okay, you know what, I'm gonna, you know, do something else to try to get there, right? Get rich or die trying, somebody said, right? So, um, so the prison is there to remind you, no, that's not the way to go. You need to stay where you're supposed to stay, toil, and then we know it's a dead end job. If we know that, you know, one in 10 will actually be able to get out of KFC and enroll in college. We know all these things, but we don't care. We keep you believing that everyone, everybody can eventually make it, and you have to do it this way, our way. So, so, if it is true that the prison is meant to essentially force the poor to accept any conditions of work out there, available, no matter how shitty, pardon my French, no matter how underpaid and so on, but you have to accept that. You have to prefer that over the risk of getting caught for taking shortcuts, right? That is the mission of the prison. That, that is something that legal theorists and criminologists call deterrence. Have you ever heard that name, that term, deterrence? That is, that is the, the idea that by threatening people with punishments, right, they will prefer to do what they are supposed to do, right, right, rather than get punished, right? So deterrence is the idea that if we make the prison sentence uh, harsh enough, people will think twice before they start dealing drugs, right? And they will weight the costs and benefits of that. They will say, okay, if I, if I, if I manage to, you know, if I rob that liquor store, I'll get, what, $2,000? But if I get caught, I will do five years, right? So ideally, people will weight the benefits, costs and benefits, that, yeah, it's not worth. I'd rather, you know, bag groceries at Walmart rather than robbing the liquor store. Okay? That's what the prison is about, and punishment in general. It is the threat of um, you know, worse, co worse consequences than the benefits that you expect from the crime. Now you realize that um, what that means is essentially that the prison is there to force people to accept legal conditions of work, again, no matter how bad those are and how much, how much they do not provide a decent living rather than going other routes, right? Think about this. What is the first thing that a parole officer tells anyone as soon as they get out of prison? Yes, but then more specific, yes, that's the general principle, but then what do they really tell you? How's, what's the way to stay out, essentially? get a job, and then what did they say? Any job. They say, get a job, any job. Am I correct? At least that's the parole officers that I've, that I've seen. They don't say get a job, but only if it pays well and you're happy with it, and it, you know, it provides a living for your family and you feel fulfilled by that. They don't say that. They say get a job, any fucking job, right? So, well, you realize then how, you know, that message by the parole officer is really the prison speaking, right? Um, get now the job, that's the message, that you should have gotten before we caught you, right? Trying to escape that job. No, that's where you eventually get back to, that job there. So. Right, here's the, here's the get a job, any job picture. 
So, and usually that job is, you know, KFC, Walmart, Wendy's, uh, McDonald's, right? It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily the most desirable job, right? So, so the role of the prison is to really deter the poor, keep the poor from committing crimes of survival and to force them to accept any job. Look, not everybody faces the dilemma, right? Faces the, the doubt, hey, should I get into this sort of illegal enterprise or should I bag groceries or find a job, any job, right? Not everybody faces those, those doubts. I did not. Growing up, I knew that I was going to go to college. Why? Because in my family, I'm not the first to go to college. And so there was an expectation, actually. That was the norm, OK? But for many other people, that is not the case, right? It's not obvious that you go to college. So you need to be reminded not to go to college, because the system doesn't really care, but that you have to be happy with whatever is out there available for you to work Okay. By the way, you know, we are told that everybody can be successful, right? That's a way to keep us spinning our wheels and, you know, keep going. Uh, I, I do not doubt for a second that any of you individually can be successful and deserve to be successful. But hey, look at the system in its, you know, in, 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 in its complexity, right? The system needs people who are desperate enough that the only option they have is this. Because if we all get college education, we, if we all go into PhDs, who is going to flip burgers for us during our lunch break? <laughs> right? Or clean our offices. Or, or, the or the bathrooms. Right? So, look, people are not born with the idea, oh, you know what, at age four, what's your dream? I want to work at Wendy's. <laughs> no. But we are socialized into thinking that that's the only option we have. But that, again, does not apply to everybody because it is not true that, you know, for everybody that's the only option we have. We know that for a vast number of people that eventually becomes the only option. But here's the thing. A system is in place to make sure that that actually happens. That there is a ready population of people, right, who will have no other option than do that. Because the other option is, well, it used to be welfare, for example, right? Or at least the possibility of getting some sort of support from the state, from the government, that's gone, essentially, as I'm sure you know. It is mostly gone, right? The only thing you can get is essentially general assistance, which, which you know, good luck surviving on that, right? Food stamps have been cut. Um, um, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that the criminal justice system is not the only system actually in charge of forcing people into those dead end jobs and to, the, to exploit them. Because the welfare system is part of that too. And by welfare system, again, I mean the fact that food stamps have been cut, that you know, there is a five year limit on any kind of federal assistance you can get. Not to mention that most people with prior criminal records cannot, cannot get welfare, right? Section 8, you cannot get if you have a drug case, right? Or other forms of, you know, kinds of welfare assistance you cannot get. So you see how a much more punitive criminal justice system, on the one hand, a system that punishes you 10 times harsher for the same things you might have done 25, 30 years ago, right? That on the one hand, and a welfare safety net that has been taken away from people you know, what is left? Employment. Get a job. Any job. But any job. Because then we know that the quality of jobs out there has worsened terribly, right? You know, a couple of generations before you, it was still possible for someone to get, you know, a basic education, uh, you know, go work into a factory, not the happiest life, right? to work for 40 years, 35 years in a, in, a, in a factory, but yet, you know, some hope that if not you, maybe your children could get somewhere, right? It was still a job, it was still kind of secure, still came with some benefits, you know, working at General Motors, working at the port of Oakland, working at, uh, 
um, you know, Ford, those jobs are gone. Those jobs are gone. The kinds of jobs that are now available are, you know, either very high skill, high, you know, hyper qualified jobs, you know, all the tech creative freaks in the Silicon Valley and, all, you know, uh, well, they're essentially destroying the Bay Area, by the way. Uh, hopefully we'll have some other time to have that conversation. But anyway, you know, either that for which, you know, you need a PhD at Stanford or cleaning their bathrooms, essentially, right? And flipping the burgers that they eat during their lunch break. Most of the middle range jobs, you know, secure, maybe not ideal, but yet, you know, yeah, I have a job and I'm going to keep it. You know, the post office, the, you know, uh, truck driver, uh, industrial jobs are gone. Now that happened, I'm going to be quick. I don't want to, I don't want to talk for too long because I tend to talk very much. My, <laughs> what, yeah, well, yeah, my wife reminds me that, of that many times. So anyway, uh, you know, those jobs are gone. And how are they gone? Or why? Well, because the economy has changed, right? We know that, you know, uh, factories have been closing down, have been downsized, right? We know that um, jobs have been shipped to other countries where, you know, the labor force is cheaper. That's why they did it, right? Because they can pay a worker one-tenth of what they pay a worker in the United States. So they just shut down and relocate somewhere else, right? Um, they wish they could pay you $3 an hour, but you know, that's not, that's not possible yet. And so as long as that is not possible, they ship jobs uh, overseas, right? Um, but so, so that happened over, you know, around the early 70s, that the economy got transformed, that, you know, the kinds of secure jobs, relatively secure jobs that were there were gone, right? And we have now a new economic system that is mostly based on insecure, precarious jobs that are underpaid. Um, but yet, the system needs to force people into those jobs. Okay? And here's where, you know, the principle of less eligibility kicks in. That principle that I was talking about earlier is simply, is, is very simple. The penal system, the criminal justice system has to work in a way that people will prefer any kind of job, legal job, to being caught and punished for committing crimes. How do you do that? How do you keep people from committing crimes and force them into the kinds of, uh, you know, very low end jobs that we talked about? By making punishments harsher, right? If you ever consider quitting your McDonald's job and start doing something illegal to survive, the punishment is going to be much harsher than it used to be. Okay? So, in other words, everybody has to accept to, you know, um, settle with whatever kinds of jobs are available out there. Now, what does, what does that mean for us? It's very important. Um, what that means is that when the conditions of life for the poor outside prison become worse, right, because people cannot find jobs, because there is no welfare, because the jobs you find are not sufficient, you know, not decent enough to give you a living, when that situation gets worse, that's when the criminal justice system will become more punitive, harsher, because you have to threaten people with terrible punishments if they're so desperate because they will be tempted to take those shortcuts, so to speak, right? On the other hand, if the conditions outside, right, for the poor improve, meaning you have options, right? You have better jobs, you have welfare safety net, you have health care and so on, the system does not have to be that harsh because people will spontaneously you know, get the better jobs that are available or, you know, uh, uh, receive welfare that is there and maybe get a better job and wait it off while they're on welfare and, and wait, you know, get a better job as soon as it becomes available, right? But if that job is not available and people have no other options, 
that's when the system becomes harsh and tells you, no way, we don't care that you have no other options. That's what we want you to do. That's what you're expected to do. That's what the system needs you to do. So does that make sense? Can you follow me? So in other words, this is a very important principle because it tells you that conditions of life for those who are punished are actually connected this way to what happens outside in the neighborhood, right? When the conditions in the neighborhood or in the city improve, people do not have to be threatened with horrible punishments. They will, they will be happy to get the decent jobs that are available. But if that's not the case, that's when the system becomes a terrorist system, a system that is there to terrorize people and to force them by any means into, into those jobs. So, so we have to look at how people are, you know, at the conditions of the poor in a society to make sense of what happens in the prisons of that society. Because the poor are the target of the prison system and the criminal justice system. Now let's see it, what happened in the United States at the same time that you know, this, this get tough on crime uh, policy was developed in the last 30 years, right, from between 1974, 75, and, and today. Um, look, this is the unemployment uh, rates in the United States, right? This is, maybe you can see here, but look, this is 19, the early 60s, right? 64, 65, you see unemployment got a, reached a low in 1966, and then look how it spikes, right? It goes up a lot, right? Now, don't look at this. I mean, this is 1929. That's the Great Depression, so that was a huge, uh, you know, hugely high unemployment rates. But 1966 to 1982, that's when they started, you know, uh, expanding the prison system, building the prison industrial complex, essentially, okay? Unemployment went up, right? So they were essentially um, warehousing the unemployed, okay? Um, look at, for example, what happens with unions, right? Usually the more workers are unionized, the better their living conditions, right? If you get union jobs, that means you have a secure paycheck, you have, you know, certain legal protections and all those things. Now, unionized jobs have been declining, right? It's very hard to get union jobs now. See, this was 1960 something, that is 2006. What that means is less and le fewer and fewer workers are into unions now. What that means is they can be fired at any time. They have no rights, essentially, right? Therefore, their working conditions have become worse. Therefore, the criminal justice system has to threaten them with horrible punishments you know, in case they consider quitting that job and doing something else. Um, income inequality, you know, the more inequality there is in a society between the rich and the poor, the more the rich will need a tough criminal justice system to keep the poor under control, right? If, if the rich become incredibly rich and the poor keep being poor, at some point you can expect that the poor, you know, will have something to say about that situation, right? Whether it is by committing individual crimes, right, as individuals, stealing and deciding, you know what, yeah, I don't buy into your story that if I keep flipping burgers, I will eventually make it, so I'm a, you know, do what, I, what it takes, what I need to do individually, or even worse for the system, collectively. When the poor say, hey, you know what? I am poor, you are poor, but maybe instead of me stealing from you, right, whatever you have, maybe we can get together and, you know, move to the next step, which is not stealing from somebody else, <laughs> but maybe put together a, you know, Black Panther Party or, uh, uh, you know, another movement for justice that, you know, asks and claims for, for social justice. So inequality has been going 
up, you know, the white has been widening in the United States. See, it was, it was much, this is the richest and this is the poorest, essentially, right? Well, C at the beginning and of, of the, you know, graph and C at the end where they essentially, right, it widens. So, um, not only that, poverty levels, right? The numbers of people, the number of people in poverty, below the poverty line, which, by the way, is a very arbitrary line that the federal government draws uh, with the very surreal expectation that people will actually be able to survive at the poverty line, right? Uh, which, is, which is very unlikely. But anyway, the numbers of people in poverty have been going up. Look, this is 1966, right? This is the 10-point program, and that's where we are today. So, so, so there is no, so my, the argument I want to put forward is that there is no, that it is perfectly understandable, not justifiable, but understandable that the criminal justice system would become so punitive, so tough, so selective, right, targeting certain populations at the time it did. This was a time of major transformations of the economy in the United States. It was a time in which the rich became richer and the poor became poorer, right? The social inequality gap widened in a way that it had never before, right? And so essentially, the criminal justice system as a system that is meant to keep society running as it does and to keep essentially the poor poor and the privileged privileged had to toughen up because the situations, the living conditions for the poor were worsening. They were becoming worse. And so nothing short of psychological terrorism, if you want, was needed to keep the situation as it is and to keep the poor in their, um, in their place. So finally, and then I'd like to uh, definitely leave uh, maybe like 15 minutes for, for some, you know, talk and conversation. Sorry, I tend to lecture very much. Uh, uh, I hope you're not, uh, you know, you're not disturbed by this. Um, but, you know, the problem is that this country has declared it used to be a war on poverty, right? It has shifted the language and the practice into a war against the poor. At one point, they decided... Yes, we're not going to win the war on poverty, because we never really meant to, by the way. Um, but, you know, here's what, we, here's what we are going to do now. We're going to target the poor as the new enemies, right? To show the rest of society that maybe the government has lost control over the economy, maybe it has lost control over, uh, you know, everything that has become global now and people start feeling that sense of the government not being able to care for them in many ways. But one thing the government can do, it's rather two things, war and punishment, war and policing. And that's the two things that the United States has been doing most prominently, if you think about it, in the past 25, 30 years, right? That is essentially what is left of state power. It's military side, outside, as well as inside the United States, okay? Yeah, that's it. Now I can drink my coffee. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, do you. For your research of the prison system, um, do you know when they started, or the increasing number of private prisons um, came into, uh, not the big things as far as our, uh, the way our economy is set up and the, the profit that comes into the private business, even versus, uh, you know, the, the state. Yes, absolutely. That's a very, very, very good question. What's your name? Robert. Robert, okay. Um, thank you, Robert. That is a very important question. You know, um, what I've tried to show here is how any penal system, any criminal justice system, doesn't matter if private or public, so to speak, is meant to reinforce social inequality, right? Now, what you mentioned is absolutely important. Um, there has been a tendency since 
the early 1990s mostly, late 80s, early 90s, to privatize punishment as well um, in different ways, either by allowing private corporations to you know, build and run prisons uh, or just to run them. You know, there's not so many private prisons. Uh, you know, there was an expectation that this would blow up, essentially, that, that there would be more and more private prisons, but that has not happened. It has happened mostly in the juvenile justice system and in immigration detention. Like all the immig most immigration detention centers are run by uh, private corporations. Um, many halfway houses are run by private corporations, such as the one, the, there is a federal halfway house where I've interviewed some people in Oakland, and that's run by Geo Corporation, right, which is one of the biggest providers of, of private punishment. Um, so that is a concerning development, but I would be more concerned, for example, by how even in public prisons or state prisons or you know, non-private prisons, you still have huge profits being made by private corporations over inmates. Um, you know, do, do you ever receive collect calls from prisons? Yes. Right, so what a scam that is, right? It, you know, we can, you can essentially talk for free now. You know, I call my father in Italy on Skype for free, and he calls me back for free. How can you explain that the families of inmates, who are usually not the most privileged people on earth, right, have to pay inordinate amounts of money for collect calls? It's like as if we were calling in you know, 1975, right, when it was still costly to call. Um, vending machines in prisons, right? You cannot cook your pasta and bring it to your, to your relative in prison. You cannot. The excuse is safety reasons, but then the consequence is vending machines that are three times more expensive than at least the ones I see in San Jose, right? So, and many more examples like that. So, yes, it is important. Pri prison privatization is important and it has to be bought back. But there are more subtle ways in which corporations are making money, you know, not to mention prison guards and that huge, huge lobby that they, uh, that they represent today, right? Um. Hi, Teresa. Hello. Thanks for coming. So you shared a lot of information with us, some of it I've heard, some of it I haven't. This is your research? Well, it's, yeah, it's part of what I work on, yes. So what are, what, are you, what are you doing with your research? Like, are you presenting this to, I mean, what are you, it's, it's good to know, but what are we doing with it? Is it impacting any area? Hmm. <laughs> Hopefully, a little bit, at least. Yeah, I, I hope that, that uh, yeah. Um, well, you know, I published some of this research. I teach it in my classes. Um, again, I, you know, I'm happy to come and, and share, with, we, share it with you. Um, if your question has to do more specifically with, you know, what is my level of engagement with these issues? Do I do any activism on this? Do I, or how is this useful to, uh, look, you know, I think, I, I, defi I would define myself a scholar and an activist. Um, I, I, really, I don't really do the two together. In other words, I think that, um, you know, you have to be a, you know, while I do research, I have my political g goals in mind, but I also think that, you know, there is a moment of understanding and critique, which is this kind of thing, right? And then that provides the tools with which I can do my activism and hopefully help others in their activist efforts uh, with more critical knowledge of what's going on. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, so for instance, what are you doing? I would, I would suppose that what you just said is about your research is informing your work in West Oakland. Yes. Can you describe what that work is? Thank you for reminding me that because I was obviously forgetting. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so, <laughs> so over the past couple of years, two years and a half actually, I've been, because um, see, most of my work is purely theory like you know, books based and stuff like that. Um, but so for the past two years and a half, I've been um, doing research, ethnographic research, and I will tell you what that is in a second. 
in West Oakland uh, with people coming back from prisons, ja prisons, jails, federal, uh, federal prisons, and so on. Ethnographic research is a type of research that, does anybody know what that is? Okay, good. So ethnographic research is the type of research where you, instead of studying people, right, or instead of studying um, or coming up with ideas about society, you actually go into the field and you try to share as much as possible the living experiences of those you study. So essentially, instead of you know, sitting at a desk and you know, looking at data about inmates and how harsh it is for them to come back from prison and find jobs, any job, and so on, you go into the field and try to talk to them and to see what it means to come back from, from jail. And you shadow them, you follow them, you interview them, you gain their trust, right? Um, so that they don't think you're a cop, for example. Um, and then you develop a relationship and over time you follow them and, and you try to document what it actually means to come back from uh, you know, uh, prison and try to reintegrate in West Oakland uh, on San Pablo Avenue, for example. Yes? When you said you were doing this work in West Oakland, are you going to programs there or just on the street? Right, that's a good question. So, so the challenging part of ethnography is making contact with the people, gaining their trust, and actually having, you know, getting people to talk to you, right? So, so what I did was I found, I don't know how familiar you are with San Pablo Avenue in West Oakland, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Which part? Well, the, the part before Emeryville, <laughs> <laughs> right? So the part from, what is it, uh, West Grand and 27th, yeah, something like that. So, so I'm based there. I have been, I actually have now uh, sort of, not quit, but I'm, I'm doing less field work because I'm, I should now start writing about it um, <laughs> eventually. But so anyway, I've, befr so there is a, as you probably know, those of you who are familiar, that is um, a a, an area of Oakland where there is a huge concentration of programs and places and halfway houses and you know rehabilitation services and stuff. So what I what I did was you know I essentially just went out there, um, started walking up and down San Pablo, uh, until I bumped into a community health clinic um, that's on 26th at uh, San Pablo. It's called Healthy Oakland. Um, it's run by a pastor. Uh, who you know has a history himself of in, you know involvement in, in the drug economy and stuff like that, and so this clinic provides health services to the poor and uninsured. And the interesting thing is that the staff of the clinic is mostly ex-prisoners who, as soon as they get out of prison or jail, start volunteering at the clinic, and then eventually some of them get hired, and so on and so forth. So I've been based at the clinic for the past couple of years. But then I've also been following people outside the clinic, you know, going to the, to the welfare office with them and see what happens there, um, following them to their houses, talking to their, you know, partners and stuff like that. So, yeah, so I've been interviewing and following and shadowing.